Okay, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the board of directors of the HETS Consortium, I would like to welcome you to our 2022 Best Practices Showcase, celebrating technology, innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Inmari, and I will be presenting the speaker for the breakout session of this room. Before we begin, we request your support on the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This session is being recorded and for those who join us virtually, please remain muted. This presentation will be in English. We will have a time for questions at the end of the presentation. And finally, we invite you to see the QR code that the staff will share to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation form for this session before you leave the room. For those virtual participants, the links to the evaluation will be available in the chat. Please make sure to select the time and date for this session. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to heads. Now we're ready to start. The title of this presentation is, It Takes a College to Graduate a Student, uh, Connecting Scholarly Teaching to a Program Level Assessment that Results in Student Success. Uh, please welcome Dr. Julia Huayin Su. Uh, from the University of New Mexico. The floor is yours. Thank you, senor. Senorita, good morning, good afternoon. It is still morning here in New Mexico, uh, USA. Um, thank you for accepting the proposal and I appreciate all those who are attending this session. What I'm going to do today, uh, let me see here is really about sharing my few year experience in terms of assessing a two year community college associate degree and what we have learned moving forward. So I'm an associate professor of sociology. I'm also chair of the social sciences division at the campus. So where is my picture? Valencia is a Hispanic, UNM Valencia is a Hispanic serving institution. We have roughly about 1700 students. The location, it is rather rural community in the state of New Mexico. In terms of our students, 60% of our students are female, 65% on financial aid. Many of them, many of our students, they need developmental courses, particularly in the general education area. They also face many non-academic barriers, such as family situations or transportation situations. Over the years, about 20% of our students transfer to a four-year institutions, such as UNM or other institutions in the state as well as in the country. So therefore, the average year of completion for the program is between five or six years. It's pretty long. So as you see the map of United States and you can really zero down to where our campus is located, almost right in the middle of New Mexico. I tell people that it is centrally isolated. <laughs> and this is our beautiful campus. So today's sessions, I will briefly talk about the challenges in program assessment of community colleges. And then I'll share with everybody the assessment model that I have used at Valencia. And then looking forward to improving the plan for assessment. So uh, as we move on, if you have any idea, anything like that, please jot down and share with me. And that would be really, really greatly appreciated. So in terms of program assessment, let me close this so you don't have to see this. Yeah. Some of the challenges facing two-year community college assessment would be uh, the transient nature of a student, because it's by nature is two-year community college. Student comes and goes, particularly when we have open enrollment, open admission, and it's really difficult to capture the student body especially their intention, but also uh, it opens up a great opportunity for us to really mentor our students' progress. The second challenge is really 
because of the trends in nature, many students change their majors and it's understandable because they're still young, they're still trying to figure out what they want to do for the rest of their life. So they move from one major into the other and while at the same time, not necessarily let the advisor know, much less that the faculty member know. So in terms of program assessment, PA is program assessment. There are many purposes why we do that. And when we assess, we really have to assess based on the purpose, the primary goal of the program. Why do we have such programs? And if you look into the literature, there are multiple models, and I'll speak a little bit more later on this, multiple models in terms of assessing the success of a associate degree, and how do we define success? So these are some of the examples here. Um, <clears throat> when we look at success, some of us define it as number of graduates that graduate from the program or number of the graduate that transfer to a four year eventually allow them to attain a bachelor degree. But other programs, we go by the industry certification examination, such as the Microsoft model, or um, other uh, internet model and things like that. There's various. One thing, one model that came up to me was really the nursing model, which is essential. And then of course we can survey our alumni after they left the program and ask them how, uh, when they graduated and what are they doing right now? Is their current job pertains to the degree that they received from us? But also we can also um, interview or survey employers in our community because one of the mission of a community college is to meet the community need rather than out of state need. And then of course, another thing is really create a capstone that encompass all the skills that the student in the program has acquired over the years. And portfolio evaluation is another one. All these are just different models in terms of assessing the program. It all depends what we want to accomplish out of the program. So here I'm going to share with you a criminology associate of arts degree at UNM Valencia. And I put down 2016, 17, 18, three years. I did three years because of the office assessment at UNM require a three year uh, program assessment. That's what I do. Ideally, I would like to do five since our graduation rate really mature in about five years or so. So one thing I noticed is uh, some of my colleagues are not distinguishing term cohort versus panel. So when we look at criminology degree, in 2016, we have 45 students in there. So that is the number of cohort in the program. Similarly, 44 for 2017 and 40 for 2018. So what about panel? Panel essentially is the number of students that enter the program in a particular year. So as you see in this table here, 2016, we have 25 new students entering the program. We have 10 students from previous entrance and four or six from previous years. So in the year of 2016, we have a total of 45 students in the program, but 25 are considered as the 2016 panel. So um, this is important for me in my purpose in terms of tracking the student success in our program. So in 2016, we have 25 new students. By the next year, we have down to nine. So 16 are no longer declared criminology as the major. And then by the third year, 2018, we only have two. So when we look at panel, it gives us a little bit more detailed information in terms of student progression in the program. But if we continue to look at number of cohort in that year, we didn't see any difference. Therefore, we think the program is pretty healthy. So that's one uh, mistake we learned. So starting point, what I am look, looking at is really, I define program outcomes as number of graduates. If they don't graduate, 
I felt like that's an opportunity for us to do better, help our students to graduate with a degree. So um, this is the model that I have, tracking the panel, not cohort, by program core courses, because in criminology, there are certain core courses pertaining to criminology that students absolutely have. There's no, uh, these are the non-negotiable courses that they have to take. But I also track the gen, general education required courses. Gen Ed stands for general education, such as math, science, and English, because it is part of their program uh, requirement. So this is my 2016 to 2018 data. So what I'm looking at is number of students completed a certain percentage of required courses per year. So how I said is it's 33%, 66%. By year three, they should finish 100% of the core courses. Similarly for general education courses. So that way I can have a overview of how the students in the program works. So as, as you see in this table now, this really getting to the nitty gritty detail. So year 2016, we have 25 entry. So by the end of the first year, seven of them finished 33% of the general education courses. Two of them finished 66% of the general education courses and eight of them finished 100% of the general education courses. However, when we look at the criminology core courses, none of them finish a minimum of 33. So there may be one or two that finish 10 or 20%, but because of how I set up the model, we did not capture those. So this is 2016 panel. Now year two would be the 2015 panel that I did not follow. But nonetheless, we have one of those students that completed the 33% uh, of the core courses. So it's rather dismal, rather discouraging for me as the division chair. So following this 25 panel students by year two, and this is good because they are progressing. So we have three students that complete 66%. We have four students that complete 100% but continues, we only have one student that complete 33% of the core courses. And then year two is really set downhill. And then we only have two students that complete 100% of general ed courses, but none in the core courses. So it was really, I'm scratching my head and it's like, what's going on? So of course, some of the reasons from the literature mentioned that students need more time for general education courses because some of them did not come to us prepared. And then others uh, could be really advising issue, how our advisors approach them, or maybe they just didn't even approach our academic advisors and they self-advise. So they are not selecting courses pertaining to the graduation. Now, many of our students also have uh, responsibilities, what I call non-academic barriers, such as family responsibility or being a parent, then they have to parental experience, uh, responsibility, uh, but also maybe to work, maybe to take care of um, a sick aunt or uncle. We are an uh, HSI institution, so majority of our students are of Latinus. And uh, we know how important in terms of the family uh, network is with students. So students really, they face certain things that uh, they just don't feel comfortable of sharing with someone who are outside of their racial ethnic group. Now, these are the, some of the main reasons for attrition when we're looking at, like I had mentioned earlier, they change major without letting us know, they transfer, to other four-year university without letting us know. Um, they left Valencia for personal reasons. Some of our female students got pregnant, so they left, okay? Um, other students who became a father, they also left because now that they have a family to take care of, or they may have transportation issues, uh, work schedule issues. Uh, many of them share a car with a family member. 
sometimes the car doesn't work. Sometimes they don't have money to buy gas. So they just couldn't show up in class. So eventually they just slowly, it became a slippery slope. They missed classes eventually, they just left completely. Yeah. And then of course these particular group is really, they came to us without being prepared for college work. So through the years in public schools, they may not have the opportunity to acquire the writing skill, math skill, which are very strong in our gen ed courses. And if their reading and writing is not up to college level and they did not get the additional help, then they feel discouraged. Others, uh, probably they saw themselves as one among 700 students. So they just felt like they are isolated. So as faculty members, as staff on campus, that's the opportunity for us to look into, to make sure that we mentor all of our students and not just one or two, yeah. And this is another huge uh, situation across the country for Hispanic students. Many of them felt discouraged because they felt lost, they felt ignored, they felt um, disfranchised. Um, they felt like they're not part of the college campus. And many of them are first generation college students. They didn't know how to maneuver the landscape of a college admission, uh, enrollment and whatnot. So, and they felt like they have no one to speak with. So it, this opens up a huge door of opportunity for us at the campus to really figure out how to make sure that our campus is inclusive, our classroom is inclusive, and our faculty and staff are also inclusive. So the opportunities are there. Now, so when I look at these numbers, I felt discouraged, scratching my head with our dean and the institutional research um, office. And I say, wait a minute, let's look at the other side of the coin. We have students losing us. But why don't we look at the students who are staying with us? Look at how successful we are. So these are the success stories that we have. When a student actually graduated with a master's degree in social work, of course not at Valencia, but they came from us, they move on, and now working as a licensed social worker. And then we have students who earned a bachelor's degree in criminology and working at a state family and children agency. Those are lovely stories, heartwarming stories. And other students graduated with a bachelor degree in secondary education. So the student obviously, all these students obviously changed the major from criminology AA to social work BA, criminology BA, and then secondary education. And it's perfectly fine because they are young, they still figure out what to do with their life. And other student, Got a BA transfer to main campus, UNM main campus, and major in accounting, and now is working for FBI. So little do we know that what are the aspirations? And other students got a major in uh, <clears throat> communication, bachelor degree, and she purposely returned return to Guatemala because that was the purpose of her coming to the US. And now is working for a nonprofit organization in Guatemala. And she and I still have continued communications over the years. And finally, as students enroll in the medical, medical school at UNM. So these are the success stories that I want to highlight because we can learn so much from them, what we have done and what we have not done for our students. So over those, so this is 2016, 17, 18, I did this program assessment in 2019. So I figured out there's something we can do so this is what I suggested to our dean, to so utilize a case management model to focus on mentoring students. If a student is in our program, what can we do to keep the persistent rate going? Uh, organize co-curricular activities. This is well established in the literature that it keeps students interest in the major and build camaraderie among them. And as far as the faculty member on campus, I actually established a learning community focusing on SOTO Reading Club. Uh, SOTO stands for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Uh, 
So his evidence-based pedagogy, encouraging faculty members on campus to really uh, identify certain teaching technique that works for their students. As a speaker, we always speak to our audience. So as an instructor, as a faculty, we speak to our student. And those are really great models to go after. And also we started now is to collaborate with academic advisors to assist student course selection. So sometimes when we see a student sign up certain courses and it's like, what are you thinking? This has nothing to do with their major. So we call up the students, speak with them, and just guide them through the landscape of college enrollment and help build camaraderie. So this is another thing that we are thinking of doing. I haven't done it yet. It's really to establish a student club in criminology. Two years ago, I also launched the criminal justice. So I have this huge cohort, cohort now, put them together in a club so they can exchange information and share their knowledge. It's what a wonderful way to build camaraderie among students. And many of them, if they move on, they will continue to keep up with their relationship with their peers. And now this, at Valencia, this is the process we're going through right now. We design a guided pathway by program. So essentially is year one, two, three, and then year one, we will tell students, you're going to take these general ed courses, you're going to take these program courses. So making sure they follow the pathway. So there's a goal at the end that they will be graduating in three years, if not four years. So those are the things that we do. Now, I have to address the weakness of the model that I've been using. Every model, there's always some weaknesses. So in this one, I'm assuming program outcomes align with course learning outcomes. Sometimes it does not. So we, I have to acknowledge that, okay? And um, the model that I have used also assumes that program outcome aligns with institutional learning outcomes. We are getting there slowly, a step at a time, but we always have to really, is a, is an evolution and is a learning process for all of us at Valencia. And I also acknowledge that because I did not track the number of courses by gen ed or core courses, like the 30%, I'm missing those who meet maybe 28, 29% and I did not capture them. So it's really the weakness of the assessment model churn out some weak numbers for me. And then of course, I explained earlier that I have to do a three year because that was required by the assessment office at UNM. And I, I'm thinking how to adjust this and turn it into a five year tracking period. And finally, clearly also, the program does not account for all the students because it's just captured those that complete certain percentages of the courses in the program. So these are really, I identify as the weakness of the program. Now, if the audience sees some other weakness that I have not mentioned, feel free to let me know because we are always trying to improve ourselves. So earlier I mentioned about institutional learning outcome. Ideal, this is the ideal model for program assessment. Get down to the basic of core learning outcomes and then include the general education learning outcome, tie it to the program learning outcome. What are the program student learning outcomes we want? What are the skills we want our students to have? What are the needs we want students to have? And tie all this to our institutional learning outcome. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a pathway, it's a pathway. And that was the goal for me. Now, down the road, what am I going to do now? We probably need to redefine student program learning outcomes. I plan to do a syllabus analysis, uh, comparing, making sure that every course is aligned with the program learning outcome. Um, I also want to do a curriculum mapping to make sure that the course map of each course include the knowledge, the skill of the students in the program to make sure they have that 
level of skills when they graduate from the program. And I'm thinking probably I need to propose to create a capstone course, maybe using portfolio evaluation to ensure to us that the student have gained the knowledge and the skills when they graduate from the program. And this is just one program. So aligning course outcomes with program outcomes, this is essential. We cannot just think that all the courses we offer through the program will provide the evidence that our program is providing the skill and knowledge for our students, but also eventually align the program outcomes with institution outcomes. So the last two bullets, we can do it from top down or bottom up, or both ways, just to make sure that the alignment is there. This is critical. So I'm ending my session right now. It is um, about 11.56. Uh, do I have any questions or anything? I put up a, uh, a QR code is really for my own purposes for this session evaluation. And I understand that Pets has its own evaluation. So um, once you have a phone, take a picture and you bookmark it, you can do this session evaluation whenever you have a time. But I believe Hats would like you to complete your session evaluation before you leave the room. Am I right? So I'm going to end um, sharing the screen now. Did you get the QR code or do you want to? No, I didn't. Uh, I told you I probably would do that. Okay, could you, uh, doctor, could you put it back on? Uh, one sure, of the... absolutely. Yes. Thank you. So let me, yes. Can you see it? No, I didn't share a screen, so I don't think I did. Let Not me do yet. it. Yeah, I have to go back to share screen first. There you go. So can you see it now? There you go. Okay. So any feedback, yeah. any suggestion, uh, constructive criticism, I'm all here. You want to? Yeah. Okay, so we have one here. Let me move the camera so you can get a better view. Go on ahead and talk. Yes, hi, uh, Dr. Song, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, when you came from the University of Houston downtown, um, I, I felt that uh, uh, your talk is really thought for voting. But can you hear me well? Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly. Uh, okay, let, let me try. You can move a little closer to the hallway because those are the microphones. That's, that's the mic. Yeah. The mic. yeah. Um, so uh, I, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, I felt Thank you. very thought for voting. Um, I also have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel the concept of link program, uh, program, what, what is the word? Program outcome model with a student success model. Uh, that's a uh, quite uh, endeavor because I felt uh, on one hand, myself, I have, I, I feel more uh, experience with the program learning outcome assessment because for accreditation purpose. Uh, we talk a lot about student success, but really if we take a step back, we say, oh, what's the definition of student success? What yes. criteria we use, right? And if uh, uh, we look at the ABAT, uh, by the way, well, we, we use uh, American Board of uh, Engineering uh, ABET, uh, ABAT accreditation criteria. It's, it's very, very technical, uh, very mechanical. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not uh, individual student based. Yes. Uh, so, uh -huh. uh, so, uh, so uh, my question for you is one is in terms of students' success, do you have a very uh, specific model or specific criteria you follow? Uh, that's my first question. And then my second question is, even just go by program, uh, you know, uh, outcome criteria involves 
quite actual workload for faculty members. How to persuade, how to have faculty buy in for this new initiative? I imagine there is a lot more workload related. <laughs> yeah, we really don't want to add additional workload for our faculty member because they're stretching so thin right now, particularly during COVID. So to address your question first, um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear well your name. Uh, my name is uh, Wei Ning, Wei Ning Zheng from, uh, Wei Ming. Yeah, from University of Houston. Dalton. Ah, okay, Wei Ming. Okay. In terms of success for this model, I define it as number of graduates. So if student did not graduate, then I consider it as the program has the opportunity to work better to be successful. So okay. it really depends on the assessors or the, the college idea of how they define success. Now, student did not graduate with a degree. That's the model I use. Now, it doesn't mean student did not acquire the skill of knowledge. It's just, we don't know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I suggested to have a capstone that encompasses all the skill and knowledge of the program. So if the student take that course, say 25 students, we're just talking about 2016 here, 25 students took that course and then uh, three of them passed the capstone course. So that means three, uh, let me do it easier, five. Five of the 25, that means it's one fifth of the panel of the program students pass the capstone course. That means presumingly they have acquired all the knowledge and skill that we want to have when they leave us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that is how I uh, define the success. Now, the second question, Wei Ming, is you're talking about how do we um, convince our faculty. I have another challenge at Valencia that I have not shared with you is uh, for any program to be successful in any colleges, we really need to have a full-time faculty that are interested and invested in the program. At Valencia, because our student's body is so small, I unfortunately do not have a full-time faculty teaching those classes. That's another huge challenge for me, is really convincing administration to hire a full-time faculty member to oversee all these courses. I'm not there yet, but one step at a time. So um, in terms of my part-time right now, I have, let me think. I have three part-time instructor teaching the criminal just, uh, criminology program. And I have to constantly in conversation with them because two of them live out of day, they teach online. <laughs> so they're looking at the syllabus, looking at the core curriculums and see how they are aligned with the program outcome, define as certain knowledge and skills. No, for example, knowing how to um, how to read a simple uh, table or simple chart. Now, granted, this is the only two-year uh, college, so many of our students are still learning how to interpret a bar chart, a pie chart, and things like that. Is this, is this um? It is a very gratifying process when a student finally get it and be able to interpret all those numbers on a chart. So it's really like, almost like a white paper, you know, is continuing white writing and improving and working on it. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, I appreciate your patience. I, I do respect all your Effort, your drive, you you know to uh, get your colleague on board with this. I, I can imagine it is, it's quite challenging. Uh, so <laughs> you have to say the list. Yes. Uh, uh, advocating and striving to do. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on the chat? If you have any other.
nothing else, you can either type it out or uh, unmute your microphone. Well, if that if there are no questions, I'm gonna just pop in the chat our uh, evaluation uh, link. Mm -hmm. Let me find this. Oh, there you go. Now, uh, University of Houston, do you use a different model to assess your program? I'm just curious. Um, we, we are very focused on program learning outcome. Uh, oh. Primarily for accreditation purpose. Oh, uh, okay. And, and it's very simple logic in the sense that uh, you know, uh, accreditation is a priority. Uh, we have to make sure it's in, you know, in good, in good form. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to, to maintain that program uh, learning outcome for accreditation purpose, uh, I felt that imposed, you know, significant actual workload strategies. Uh, and, uh, so the world is starting how this is going to be fairly, uh, equitably uh, workload. Uh, then on top of that, if we say, oh, we also combine students' success. Of course, you will say these two are the same, right? But on the other hand, the, the, the devil is at the details. Uh, how, what criteria, what set of criteria you use for program learning outcome? What set of criteria you use for student success? Are they 100% matched? Uh, or, and, and those details are, uh, you know, uh, I, I think uh, on implementation side uh, have a lot uh, involved. Uh, yeah. But again, as I said, we primarily focus on program learning outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. just, just on that front, it was so sometimes it can be caused quite a bit of stress. <laughs> I, I understand. Now, University of Houston is a four year university, to my understanding. Uh, University of Houston is a system. There are four separate institutes. We uh -huh. have University of Houston downtown. Okay, yeah. So it is a four year university right. then. Yeah. So uh, the challenges, I think for four year might be easier. I don't know. I have been always a, a community college um, faculty and administrator, but with four year university, students are in your, on your campus longer than us. So you don't have transient student population that we face, that kind of situation. Yeah, uh, but surely- we have a significant percentage of transfer students. Ah, okay. Uh, but because it's four years, I give us the time space to work things out. Two years, <laughs> I, uh, the time space is, is limited. Yes, I agree, absolutely. Although now, um, today's students take them at least six years to graduate with a BA. Mm in general <laughs> in general we are lucky that if our students from a community college graduate in three to four years we do have but not a lot yeah that that is the other point i haven't quite mentioned that the way you look at the plan rather than cohort it make the analysis much more granulate uh, very very detailed uh, very thorough but on the other hand uh, it, it's, it's more challenging. <laughs> it oh. is, it is. Because for years, uh, every fall body thought that the criminology program was working fine because the number of programs, students in the program are rather consistent over the years. It's always in the 40s. It didn't go up, it didn't go down. But then all of a sudden people are thinking that, well, student coming in, if we have this consistent number of 40, every year we have students, this program should grow bigger. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case because we have some students that just quietly left us. 
So the case management is um, is very is almost like a hand holding, but again, um, that's why I titled this presentation. It takes a college to graduate a student. Uh, very, very true, very true. But again, it's a huge endeavor. One other question: Do you have any software platform to facilitate your data collection, data analysis? Any program? Oh, our yes. IR office uses a Stata. So what he did is he pulled the student numbers from our student. We use Banner at your now. So pull the data from Banner, and then he uses um, Stata, the statistical package program, to analyze those. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's not very. It's not software package dedicated for. Yeah. No, that's it. no, I don't think so. Yeah. 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 Um, analysis tools. Yeah. I, uh, years ago when I worked in Texas, I used to work for the Dallas. Now it's called the Dallas College. It used mm -hmm. to be the Dallas County Community College. Oh, I and see. I, yeah, I, when I was there, the several years I worked in the institutional research office and we use SAS. But now there's so many programs. There is actually a free program called R that I'm really very interested to look into it. Okay. And it's free, you can download it. And uh, one of our statistic faculty member on campus is also using R. So I see as me a part, you know, just a learning opportunity to really converse with her. I just recently find this out. So um, my husband downloaded R and then he's just like very, convoluted he said it's very difficult to use so um we don't know i i personally don't know i would just say explore that yeah this is some interesting idea there yeah yes, thank you. yes. Yeah, really appreciate it. oh i appreciate you coming thank you yes thank you. thanks ladies for no problem <laughs> obviously yeah, thank you well i will stop recording doctor thank you so much for your insight and I hope to one of these days you can join us here in Puerto Rico. Yes, I, it, <laughs> I <laughs> hope so. Indeed, at first I was um, I submitted when I submitted my proposal, I was really planning to go there. But that okay. was before before Omicron came to the US. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> so right now, um, New Mexico is a state. Our positivity rate is over 30 percent. Oh, wow. I am not going anywhere. Nope. Yeah. Better to stay safe. <laughs> yes, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank and you. You all, you all stay safe too. You too. Mm -hmm.